that God's doing. Uh, and so Rob and I asked her to come and bring a word of greeting. And so, babe. Well, as we've already expressed, it's it's a great delight to be here. And um, immediately as we walked through the door, I saw this familiar face and this one and this one and lots of greetings and hugs. And um, we we are just so thankful for all that God is doing. And it is a thrill to be here today to um, give the credentials to Jake because really when we when they moved from Clear Lake here, he literally was in a car seat and we have had the incredible joy I'm get emotional of watching God's hand on a young man shape him and grow him and um, so it, it really is such an honor to be here today. We we came as pastors in 1992 just a few short months after we got married, and it really was in this church that God shaped me as a young leader, because it was my, um, I was a newbie. <laughs> it was my first place to be a pastor's wife, and then while we ministered eight years here, um, God asked me to um, step up and actually get my pastor's license, and so so many of you were a part of that journey and a part of helping shape me as a leader. And so I say thank you for that investment um, in our lives as we were here. And um, it's just really, really fun to come back and um, see all that God is doing and what he's, um, what he's working in all of you. So um, there is a verse that the Lord reminded me of this morning, which is so fitting for all of you um, in our time here. It's um, 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but in that chapter, there's this one sweet verse, and it says, your lives are a letter written in our hearts. And that is so true, um, so true of, of our years together and our ministry together. Um, your lives aren't just written on the attendance of who used to attend Boone Open Bible. Your lives are written here. And um, we are just blessed to have been able to be here as pastors and really a joy to be here today. So way to go, Jake. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, sweetheart. I remember the day that we left. It was May 1 of 2000. Actually, it was um, April 30th was our last Sunday. And uh, I remember uh, fondly that last day. I mean, it was a big transition day. And then the next morning, we, you came over by our house. I think we had one more final word, and we took off in the U-Haul or Ryder truck or whatever it was. And uh, Steve, you came in. Steve, you got to stand. That's, this is Naomi's brother. And so I've had the privilege of working with Phil and Naomi here for seven and a half years, and, and uh, Steve is our executive pastor in Rockford, and, uh, and then uh, they just unpacked their U-Haul yesterday, and uh, in our office, we're, we've just gone through another major transition in our lives, and uh, excited about this next chapter to be written. I'd like you to get your Bible and turn with me to John 13. The good thing is, is there are lots of new faces and families that uh, you would say, I don't know who this strange guy is. I wish you'd stop talking about the past and get in the present. Hey, we're going to get in the present real fast. Because uh, this, is, this is the present day reality of Palm Sunday. And I want to tell you that uh, as we are worshiping this morning, uh, a couple of the songs just really spoke to my heart. And um, I, I am really excited about uh, the message today. And uh, I wrote down the words of the chorus, and I don't know the, the name of the song, Jake, that you were leading, um, but it says, He has paid the highest price. He has proven His great love for us. We will praise Him with our lives and proclaim our love for Him. Wow. He has paid the highest price. I know we get excited about Easter, and... Um, but I, I, I don't want to skip over Palm Sunday. This, this is big. It's a big deal. Um, and I, I'm going to speak to you out of John 13 today on this subject, Portraits of Passion. Portraits of Passion. Uh, today being Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of 
Others call it Passion Week. Uh, Jesus Christ was returning to Jerusalem because the time had come. I want you to know timing is everything. There were times people wanted Jesus to get to Jerusalem. I mean, there was a lot of stuff happening in Jerusalem all the time. But Jesus knew His time hadn't come. But right now, He knows the time has come and He's headed into the city of Jerusalem where He's going to lay down His life. In John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, all are the last words of Jesus. Just hours before, uh, He would lay down His life. I want you to look with me at verse 1. John 13 and verse 1. And I, I love this verse. I probably preached on this passage when I was here uh, as pastor, but I want you to know uh, this is a fresh message for you today. So John 13 and verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He now showed them the full extent of His love. You know, it's one thing to think about uh, how much love that we can comprehend in our mind. Um, I was sharing with a couple of people before service. My mother is uh, today in her 40th day at uh, Iowa Methodist Hospital. And uh, her life has been in the balance. My mom has been battling cancer for six and a half years and um, I can tell you, uh, this last few weeks, we've, we've been able to look back together. I've recalled some of the most tender times in my life when my mom has shown me the greater extent of her love. And the unreal and unusual thing is, these last few weeks, I've been able to show my mom a greater extent of my own love for her in uh, times when her life has been so fragile. But I want you to know, all through Jesus' life, we see love in a very powerful way. We see pictures of His love all the way through the Gospels. But it's like in these last hours and last minutes and last days of Jesus' life, He's going to pull back the curtain and show His love in a way that uh, is even greater. He showed them the full extent of His love. I want to define for you the word passion. Portraits of passion. Passion is ardent affection. Warm feelings expressed in eager, zealous support. Passion is also defined in the dictionaries as the sufferings of Christ. I mean, how much greater can you describe love than looking at the cross of Jesus Christ? I mean, look at the life of Jesus. He took on our sins. He received the penalty and the payment. He became the payment for our sin for a lost world. I mean, you cannot describe passion greater than that. It says He now showed them. One thing I love is somebody who won't just talk about love or, or say, I love you. I want somebody to show me they love me. He now showed them the full extent of His love. And then that full extent, I think about the verse out of uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 3.18, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And uh, some of you, like me, you've known the Lord a good many years. And I'll tell you what I do in a week like this is I'm saying to the Lord Jesus, Jesus, I have loved you, and you have loved me more than I could ever love you, but help me to love you in a new way this week. Help me, God, to comprehend your love for me and your love for the world in a greater way this week. Then let's define the word portraits. Portraits is a painting or photograph of a person especially one depicting the face or head and shoulders so, so we can really see who this person is. 
Let me show you a couple portraits, and they're going to put them up for you. This first one is very familiar to us, and uh, this is uh, an actual photograph of, of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. For many years, I had this picture hanging in my office. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a religious painting. Matter of fact, it's probably one of the top three religious paintings in the world. But I want you to know that that picture says something to me because I understand the timing of that picture. That's known as the Last Supper, but I'm telling you, sitting around breaking bread together, Jesus was going to reveal himself in a very powerful way. Here's a second portrait you can look at. And that's Jesus, and we're going to talk about it a bit here, where he, he takes off some of his robes, and he gets a basin of water, and he kneels in the, in the posture of a servant to wash his disciples' feet. And that's a powerful, powerful portrait about a leadership principle for all of us to consider today. I'm going to give you three portraits of passion this morning. Three portraits of passion. Now, for those of you that were around when I used to preach here, um, somebody kidded me this morning, are you going to use three L's today? See, I used to always have the same letter. They don't start with the same letter today. I, I know. Hey, I've had to change, Jake. I, I've even had to change, all right? So three portraits of passion, and uh, the first one is service. The first portrait is service. It comes out of verses 4 through 14. Now, I'm not going to read these because all of these come out of John chapter 13. But uh, this first one, service, is washing the disciples' feet. This is the act of serving somebody. Now, I, I want you to look with me first at his experience. His experience. Now, remember this. When we look back, and, and we're, we're not going to have them flip back to the picture, but you think back to the picture of Jesus on his knees with a basin, washing his disciples' feet. Here is Jesus who is weaving through the story and the conversations with his disciples, really who he is. Matter of fact, in Matthew 16, in a conversation with his disciples, he said, who do others say that I am? But then he made it very personal and he asked Simon Peter, who do you say that I am? But all the way woven through the Gospels is the story of who he is. And, and he was introducing himself as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the promised king. And I want you to know in his experience, you will not find Jesus seated at a place of honor. Instead, Jesus takes the position of a servant. I, I'm, I am thankful for some of the changes that have happened in the church. I look back to uh, the first two pastorates I had prior to coming to serve as the pastor at Boone. And both of those churches, I don't know why it was tradition, but the pastor sat on a big chair on the platform. I never liked it. I felt so uncomfortable by it. Matter of fact, in, in Des Moines at the church I served before coming here, there were four big chairs on the, on the platform. And uh, they, were, they were for what they called the important people. I didn't like it. Matter of fact, I, I just every time we kind of shuffled things, I'd move another chair off. I was like, you know, eventually I'm going to get off this platform. And, uh, and it was a mindset that we had to adjust and change. But one of the things I so valued when we came to Boone was you didn't have a chair on the platform for me. It's just uncomfortable for me because I don't see any, I don't see any imagery of Jesus trying to take a place of honor or importance. Matter of fact, Jesus was the kind of leader who would stoop to serve others. And I, I see that as a valuable principle. Jake, as a young leader, uh, Phil, as a, as a uh, more mature pastor, yeah, just face it, you're old. You're getting old, you know, just like me. But, but I want to tell you, all of us as leaders, doesn't matter, we ought to take the place of servant. And um, 
Robin and I and a couple of our board members were in Texas uh, a month ago, and we were at a church, and and uh, and it's an ethnic church, and they're kind of into uh, honoring the leader, so they have the fancy chairs that set up front, and and uh, we walked in, and I just took a seat in the third third to the back row uh, area, and as the service started, they came and escorted us up. It, it's just one of those things that I, I, I've been there many times, but I am not going up to that front chair. Now, they might escort me there because in their culture, that's a very important thing. Yeah, but I'm not going to seek after that chair, okay? And, and I see that in Jesus. It, but see, that's just the opposite of what his disciples were struggling with. They were worrying more about who was going to sit next to Jesus. And, and Jesus was trying to model, and Jesus was trying to show them out of his own experience that uh, never think You're somebody special. Instead, keep a heart of a servant leader. And so while the disciples were arguing over who is the greatest, Jesus was more concerned about how he could serve those who were following him. Their feet were dirty. They were travel-worn. They were dusty. Uh, The roads might have been muddy. And their sandals left their feet exposed. And, And so Jesus is is preparing a basin to wash their feet. Now, normally, a servant in a household would wash the feet of the guests. And so the disciples thought, this is not the right picture. I don't feel comfortable with this. And yet, uh, Peter, probably the most vocal, he resists. And he said, Jesus, you are not washing my feet. I want to tell you there's some resistance in all of us. There will be things that Jesus asks you to do, or there will be things that Jesus wants to do in you that you're going to resist. I've resisted some of those things. And I have to say, I don't proudly admit that, but I have resisted some of the things that God wanted to do in my life. And, and Peter is resisting that now. And, and, and he, he just cannot fathom his leader stooping to wash his feet. But I want you to look with me at verse 14. Chapter 13 and verse 14. After he washes their feet, he says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now, there are some churches still in this day that uh, consider foot washing kind of like an ordinance of the church. And uh, I, I'm not going to get into that theological debate today, but, but what I want to challenge you with is it, it's not just about keeping each other's feet clean. It's about being willing to get into each other's dirt. One thing I, I will value and appreciate is that that... There are saints of God that are willing to love on people who are really broken. There are saints of God that are willing to to go into places to rescue people who are really messed up. While others will sit by and say, hey, I'm I'm not going to get involved with that. Reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan. Where where several passed by and they said, hey, hey. That, that's too messy for me. And I want to tell you, over our years, we've had the opportunity to get involved in messes. We've had opportunities that we, we could say yes and, and do the Jesus kind of thing and say, we're going to get involved. So our example, Jesus said, is that we're going to be willing to do for others what Jesus would was willing to do for us. Get into their messes and their mess-ups getting into their dirty hearts and their dirty heads. I want to tell you, in our work at the church, uh, I, I can tell you on Sunday morning we can all look really cool and great, and uh, we, we'll get dressed up for Sunday church. But I want to tell you, uh, frankly, there are messes all over the place in the church. People that are struggling. People that are facing opposition. People that are being tested and tempted. 
And we're going to have to be willing, even in this, uh, in that group that Jesus was sharing that last supper with, and in this group that Jesus is washing feet, he, he's got some real shysters here in this church. But he's willing to care for their needs. He even addresses in the Scriptures about us being concerned about orphans and widows. Us being concerned about children. Us being concerned about the least of these, the poor. The sick. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 43, Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. And I want to tell you, Jesus puts people across my pathway every day that I can serve. Helping someone out along the way. And then in Ephesians 6 and verse 7, it says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. When I have an opportunity to serve, see, the portrait I might see might be a lady, but in actuality, I am serving Jesus. By serving her. I might see on the outside a, an unshowered, uh, disheveled person, but really I see the portrait of Jesus. Because he says, as we're serving, you're serving the Lord, not men. So that's the first portrait, is serving. The second portrait is grace. Is grace. And this is knowing Judas's betrayal. In verses 18 through 30. So we move from this from the story of Peter reacting to being served with the washing of the feet to the story of grace, which was Jesus knowing who was going to betray him. Undeserved favor is grace. Now think about Jesus and Judas. On this night, they ate together. Jesus washed. Judas's feet. Matter of fact, the Gospels tell us that Judas was sitting right next to Jesus. And all that time, Jesus knew this is the guy that's going to betray him. Now, I, I, I want to challenge you. Hang on here. All of us have felt the pain of betrayal. It might have been a, a spouse who betrayed you. It might have been a child who betrayed you. It might have been a co-worker who betrayed you, but all of us have had an experience in life where we felt betrayed by someone. Jesus wasn't ignoring what he knew. He didn't deny the depravity behind the betrayal. But I, I want to tell you the truth about traitors. The truth about traitors is they're hypocrites. They're people who look right on the outside but they're very different on the inside. And I want to tell you, throughout my life, I've been betrayed. I've been betrayed by people who loved me, and I've been betrayed by people who didn't even like me. I've been betrayed by people outside the church, and I've been betrayed by people inside the church. And I want to tell you the story is true. It really doesn't matter, because it really wasn't about me. Okay? And I can tell you that the, the betrayal here it becomes a great message for the disciples to understand the real picture of, of grace. Now, I, I have to tell you, when I think about this portrait of Jesus, I struggle. Because I've gone back to some of those moments when I was betrayed by somebody I loved and somebody I thought that loved me. And I want to tell you, it, it quickly gets my feelings at work. But the treatment of the traitor by Jesus is a powerful lesson for you and I. You know, if I was there in that room, or if you were there in that room, and you know the person that was seated next to you at supper was going to betray you, for 30 pieces of silver, uh, you might think about putting something in their food. Or maybe saying, hey, 
Bring him the short end of the loaf of bread. Give him the crust. All right? But that's, that's not what Jesus does at all. Matter of fact, you could say, well, maybe when Jesus washed his feet, he might have bent his big toe over extra hard. You know, take that. that. No, that's what we would do. See, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus loves people in spite of what they do. Now, I'll tell you, this, this portrait of grace for me has been very powerful to be willing to love even people that are traitors. Even people that betray you, love them. It's a tough test for people who are in the church. How do you handle people who fail you? How do you handle people who walk away in your life? How do you handle people that, that say things that aren't true about you? And I want to tell you, it, it's the big test for all of us. We must become more like Jesus, willing to offer grace and passion even when you know someone's up to something that's not good. Willing to accept people without partiality. In other words, not showing favoritism, just loving people anyway. Willing to accept other people's styles without being jealous or without being so critical. Willing to accept offenses. In other words, they have offended me, but not letting that offense grab a hold of me that it becomes a grudge or it becomes kind of a payback. So that's the kind of portrait of grace that God wants us to see in this Palm Sunday week. The third portrait is honesty. Honesty. And this is revealing Peter's denial. And, uh, you know, all of these three pictures had some pain in them. But when you read about in verses 36 through 38, Simon Peter, how he got so, you know, I, I'm going to stand up for you, Jesus. And uh, Jesus responds to him. You know, Peter's declaring great loyalty. I'm going to be loyal to you, Jesus. And uh, Jesus questions his destiny because he said, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're, you're going to deny me not just once. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter in his mind cannot even imagine that because behind the scenes, he's just willing to say, Jesus, I'm all in. And in just hours, he's going to be pegged as, you're a friend of Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus. And he's going to say, hey, not me. That you got the wrong guy. The reality that Jesus predicted would become true in Peter's life. Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 32 said this, You will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And church, I want to challenge you with something today. Uh, this really wasn't part of the preparation for the message, but this morning when I got up early, the Lord was speaking a word to my heart to share here uh, along with this message. See, the first two portraits are, are fairly easy for the church of the 21st century. Because as I travel, I hear a lot of sermons on love and grace. Service is really an act of love, but, but love and grace. But I want to tell you this third portrait is equally important, and that is... Because in John chapter 1 and verse 14, when it's introducing, when John is introducing Jesus to us through Scripture, he says of Jesus, he is full of grace and truth. Truth. It's interesting to me, in my life, God has at times prodded me because it didn't come natural for me but to to begin to confront people with truth in their life. See, you can be a pastor that just loves people and loves people and overlooks their sin, but I want to tell you, there are, 
you must also be a pastor that's willing to confront truth. Jesus full of grace and truth. Peter was being confronted about what what he didn't have a clue was coming. But Jesus was willing to say to Simon, you're going to deny me three times. But here's the thing. I don't think he said it in an attitude or in words or in an expression that was unloving. I think Peter could look in the eyes of Jesus when Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. I think what what Simon Peter saw back out of the eyes of Jesus was, but I still love you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Paul says to the church, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, it says, Love rejoices with the truth. We just celebrated Valentine's Day just last month, and I I want to say this. I, I so value this about my wife's relationship with me and others that are very close to us in our life is that we are... We are at a level of loving that we don't just avoid truth. And I want to tell you, it it takes time to get there, but it will also take a great strength in your relationship. It will take a strong love that you can be loving and yet truthful and be able to speak truth to one another. Willing to shoot straight with others so as to warn them. That's what Jesus was basically doing. Warning Peter. Hey Peter, you're setting yourself up for a fall. You're saying here in the presence of your other friends and my followers that you're going to stand with me. But I'm telling you, you're not. And it was a huge, it was a huge thing in Peter's life because he had a hard time getting over that. But I want to tell you, the grace of God was able to help him get over that. The strength of God rose up in him. And just 40, 50 days later, he is standing on the streets of Jerusalem, boldly proclaiming the truth of who Jesus was in an atmosphere that was not all that safe and secure. Willing to say what is hard now in order to save them. The portraits of passion, service, washing the feet of a resister, grace, the treatment of a traitor, and honesty, the words to a denier. Now let me show you the greatest picture, the greatest portrait of Jesus. I think it's up here, maybe next, right there. That's a picture from the Passion of the Christ. The only R-rated movie we've ever seen and attended. The Passion of the Christ. That was shown when we were pastoring Rockford, Illinois. We were at a theater on the south side of Rockford. And there wasn't a dry eye in the, in the place. Matter of fact, it, it was such a, a dead silence in his suffering. And then you could hear sniffles around the room. People who were trying to, uh, trying to endure... Matter of fact, there were moments I had to close my eyes. I Because, frankly, all the pictures of the crucifixion looked pretty good. But not these. They were horrible. They were hard to look at. But I believe they were probably more real than any of the others that had been portrayed. The greatest portrait of the Passion we'll celebrate this coming Friday. And I... I I will never forget what He's done for me. I will never forget what He's done for you and I, and I will never forget what He's done for everyone around the world. If they'll only understand it, if they'll only respond to it. Look with me at verses 15 through 17 quickly. Jesus, after He was coming to the close of the 
of the washing of Peter's feet and all the disciples, he said this in verse 15. He said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So think of that. What act of service could you and I show our neighbor this week? What act of service could you show a classmate this week? What act of service could you show someone in this congregation on the way out the doors today? What act of service will you display? And as they look at you, they're going to see your face But in another instant, they can see the face of Jesus because of the portrait they snap of you. How about in grace? My wife and I have had to learn this afresh. As in the last couple of years, our son has walked away from the Lord. And um, even last night, late, he stopped by our home. And and this morning, he was back at our house early. And we are just trying to love our son in the middle of his battle, in the middle of his struggle. And I know sometimes... In my past, I've had thoughts of, if you love too much, will will it look like you're condoning? I want to tell you, I've come to this conclusion. Jesus loved really messed up people. He even hung out with really messed up people. I don't have to wear a badge for my son to think that I'm not approving. But we're in this tension of of still loving, but, but... giving grace in the middle of his confusion. Let me ask you, who is it in your life this week that God's going to ask you to show grace to and grace for? Interestingly, I found this true not only in myself, but I found it true in other people that I love, is often the things that we've needed grace in, we become the least patient with. In our life. But how about it this week? What situations are going to arise that will challenge you to just show grace anyway? Okay? Then how about honesty? The willingness to speak words of truth to someone. I can tell you this. In my role as a regional director, I've had to speak very clear words of truth to people who I knew weren't going to like it. But I, I'm, I was done playing the game. I was done dancing around the table. I was done just circling the wagons and willing to say, listen, face the truth. Now, we can do that in a nice way. We don't have to get ugly in it. But, but who is it this week that's going to come across our path that God may want us to, in a loving, graceful way, speak the truth? In love. Then look down with me at verses 34 and 35. He says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So in other words, these three ways to show love, service, grace, and honesty, he says, I want you to do that to others. Now, he says here a new command, and I want you to know that word new doesn't mean it's it's uh, uh, brand new. It's new uh In time, meaning something fresh. It's a fresh picture. Doesn't mean that it's new in a new dimension. This fresh way to portray passion to others. I love those words in verse 34 as I have loved you. Think about the passion of Jesus. 
and they're going to put this up there. Love is, uh, love is unconditional. Oh, go, go down one more. Oh, maybe. Go back, go back three, maybe. Sorry. Love is unconditional in expression. Without condition. In other words, no ifs or demands. Love is unselfish in its motive. Unselfish in its motive. No manipulation or control needed. And then thirdly, love is unlimited in its benefits. Love is unlimited in its benefits. You see, Jesus' love never went part way. Jesus' love goes all the way. He walks all the way with us. His passion. That's That's our job to reveal His passion. See, we can, we can get so focused on, on the work of the cross, and I, I'm saying don't forget that, but I want to tell you something. This week, we can point people to the work of the cross, but I want to tell you, if you're going to make a difference in the lives of the people around you, you're going to show it in service, you're going to show it in grace, and you're going to show it in honesty. Passion becomes our work, and then passion becomes our witness. By this, by these portraits, all men will know that you are my disciples. Another chorus that um, was led this morning, I took one line from that chorus. I wrote it down. I will live. I will live to love you. Karl Barth was a Swiss Reformed theologian. He was born, I believe, in the 1860s or 70s. He was called the greatest Protestant theologian of the 20th century. Now, just so you know, I don't agree with Karl Barth on all of his theology. But he, he was a studier of the Word of God. His influence spanned far beyond uh, just his influence group. Uh, he really is a man who is well known in the church world. And this Swiss theologian came to America in April of 1962. That's the year I was born. It's the month before I was born, actually. And his picture then appeared on the cover of Time magazine. And uh, at Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago, he was lecturing. And at the end of his lecture, there was a question and answer time. And a student at the University of Chicago asked, Karl Barth, if he could summarize his whole life's work in theology in one sentence. Now, Karl Barth has written volumes of this. And there was a pause, a brief pause, and Karl Barth's answer was this sentence. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Simply profound. Now all of us in this room probably accept the fact that Jesus loves me. But around Boone County, Around the greater Boone area, there are hundreds and thousands of people who need to see Jesus through you. I want you to bow your head with me this morning. I don't do the every head bowed and uh, eyes closed and raise your hand. I'm not into secret vows and commitments at this point in the service. But I'm going to ask for a response today. 
And I don't want you to respond because your neighbor does or because you think your pastor will be impressed because you stood or you feel pressure because if you don't respond, somebody may think you have a serious psychological problem. But I want to ask you, have you been making life all about you? And in the message when we talked about service, doing something for someone else, doing something that involves getting into somebody else's mess. And that speaks to your heart. And you say, God, I've been self-focused. And in this holy, you weren't about yourself. Matter of fact, whenever that rose up in Jesus during Holy Week, he had to put that aside. He wrestled with God in the garden. He said, Lord, if, if possible, let this cup pass from me. But he moved right on to nevertheless. If you're here today and you're willing to say, I'm going to make a fresh vow to paint a portrait in my life of service to others, you're going to hold just a yes in your heart just for a moment. I'll come back and get your response. And then others, you're here and and there are people around you, just as I've been vulnerable to share with you about our son. But there are others in your life that uh, they're stretching you to the max and, and they're pulling the wool over your eyes or trying to and, and they're playing games with you and you'd like to just react. But the story about how Jesus responded to a traitor And Jesus just kept showing grace. I wonder who it is in your life. Or maybe it's somebody that's going to be in your life this week. Somebody that God's going to bring across your path. And it's going to be easy to dismiss them. It would be easy to push them away. But the Lord is going to ask you to show them grace. To love them even when they don't deserve it. To give to them even when... Nothing in you wants to give. And you're going to say yes. I just want you to hold that response for a moment. And in the last portrait, as I talked about Jesus' honest words to Peter, it, it sparked something in you because... Maybe with your spouse, or maybe with your parents, or maybe with your kids, or maybe with one of your closest friends. You haven't really been walking in honesty. And you say, you know what? We're just kind of living behind masks. And I need to start being more honest. I, I can be honest in a nice, kind way. A nice respect. I need to start being honest. And and I'm going to take the mask off today. Maybe you haven't even been honest with yourself. Maybe you've been claiming one thing in front of other people. And living another thing in the secrecy of your home. Or the secrecy of your business. Or the secrecy behind the scenes. And the Lord's asking you this morning to say yes. Now, whether in service or in grace or in honesty, the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart about an action today. I want you to stand to your feet. In service or in grace or in honesty. Jesus, 
thank you for stretching out your arms on a cross for me. Jesus, thank you for picking up a basin with water and showing us a picture of how to serve. For those that are standing in this room that say, I want to become a fresh picture of service to those around me. I want to get out of myself. I I want to get out of the captivity I've been in about focusing so much on me. And I want to start doing for others and, and pouring into others and blessing others. Father, I pray that You will by Your Holy Spirit, open the eyes of those in service so they can begin to see the picture of You serving and how You want to serve through them. God, for those of us that have been messed up with traitors around us and people that are are using us and people that are betraying us, I pray, Lord, that You'll give us a picture of You and how You treated Judas It would be quick and easy and natural to be defensive and even full of retribution. But God, You have called us to lean into You and to let You settle the matter. And I pray, Lord, that You'll give us the kind of heart that will look at the traitors and the betrayers around us and love them anyway. I pray, Lord, for those that stood. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them a fresh picture of how amazing your grace is. Not just for me, but how amazing your grace is for the stinkers around us and the traitors around us and the betrayers around us. And help us to treat them like you treated Judas. Father, I pray for those that stood because they want to start being honest with themselves. And they want to be honest with those that they love and those that love them. And and they want to live in a new realm, a new level of love that will embrace honesty that we'll be able to talk in a more honest way about the way things are and the way things ought to be. I pray, Lord, for husbands and wives in this room that have been avoiding conversations because they want to avoid the truth. I pray, Lord, that this week You'll open up the conversation lines and there will be a willingness to be transparent and there will be a willingness to love as they walk through honest conversation. Do that with parents and children as well. Do that with brothers and sisters in this body where maybe there's been some disagreement or some misunderstanding. I pray, Lord, that we'll begin to be honest and live honestly with one another. For those that stood, Lord, help them to be bold and to be brave. Speak the truth in love. Father, as we as we look at your picture and we look at the pictures of your son and the portraits of passion, may we put our selfie sticks away and may we become the portraits in our home in our neighborhood, in our schools and workplaces, and in this community, that others will see Jesus at work through us. In Jesus' name.